And outside of the doll, we had smaller Republican and Communist groups, the ARD, Communist Party of Ireland, and the Workers' Party. And these all came in together and formed what became the Right to War campaign. Um, and the, the way we were able to do it, and this is the coalition building part of it, I suppose, uh, we wanted to build it as broad as possible, to bring as many people in as we could. So we didn't have any restrictive rules. It was really simple. Two beliefs, or two, two, um, two, yeah, two beliefs, I suppose. Believe that war is a human right, and uh, if you wanted to seek to abolish war terrorism, you're in the campaign. Sort of, whether you like it or not. If that's, if that's your position, you're in the campaign. So we were putting it to people. Um, and it worked quite well. Lo loads of people um, backed it. But, but we were constantly, particularly by certain political parties, being pushed down the road of you need to select your tactics. And we kept saying, no, this is about strategy. So it was a huge debate and, and rows about tactics and strategies. Um, what we came up with in the end was that every group was entitled to implement their own tactics, uh, provided they were peaceful, uh, including, so first off, and this is how it all started, um, the physical prevention of the water meter installations. So. One woman in Cork in February 2014 posted on her Facebook page and said, they're trying to install a water meter. I'm a single parent. I can't afford to pay another bill. Will somebody come and help me block these people from putting this hold on my life? And a flood of people came out on the street and blocked it. This here is an eating more in Dublin because it's spread there. I have other pictures that I don't have enough time to show you of 20 guard A surrounding one water service who's worker trying to install a water meter in the ground. Um, so that was one tactic, prevent the installation of water meters because it damaged them financially. Second big tactic was the boycott of the water as a non-payment campaign. That was, that was led by some political parties and uh, one particular trade union wasn't, wasn't um, called for by everybody. Uh, but it was a massively successful uh, part of the campaign as well, um, which we can talk about after. Mass demonstrations, I think that was the thing that quite the shit out of our government, uh, to be quite frank, when the first demonstration happened, I was the liaison with the Gardaí, our police force, and the police were absolutely gobsmacked. They were about to send the lights squad in, but they couldn't believe the numbers that had just turned up. They had predicted 15,000 people on the streets. Then we had local demonstrations, which I'm going to talk you through a little bit in a, in a moment. And we had a political strategy for the elections, and then finally we had a political education process, which Steve is going to talk about as well in a little bit. So we five tactics wrapped up in one big strategy. And and as I said, it started in 2014 with one woman saying, please help me block this water meter uh, installation. Um, then in April of that year, our, our union and a number of other unions, I don't know what happens with them. Uh, our union passed a uh, water charges motion and a number of other unions that passed. And so the unions had then free reign to come in behind the campaign. Um, the coalition meeting happened in the, on the 2nd of June 2014 in Leinster House, facilitated by Richard Boyd Barrett, who's a People Go For Profit TD. Um, and all of those groups that I mentioned earlier, all of those uh, who were initially there, they, that, that's where the campaign sprang from. Uh, we did the mapping process and, and tried to extend it. We had a launch. One key thing, I mentioned about Dennis O'Brien, a uh, billionaire in Ireland owning so much media. We knew immediately, well I knew immediately, I'd already worked for 10 years roughly in the media industry and um, in, in Ireland that I knew it quite well. We knew we weren't going to get sympathetic coverage from the mainstream media. So the, the way we launched the campaign was we set up a petition on our website and we had 70,000 people signed it and that immediately gave us the ability to communicate directly with those people and not rely on press releases getting covered of the sun or the star or whatever you're having yourself. So, um, so we, we now have a direct line for all of the different uh, protests and events that we were planning coming up uh, and the petition remained remained open for two years. Uh, and then the union's role in this, and our role was, um, we did all the graphic design, we printed up half a million flyers, and put that in context, like Ireland is the size of Manchester, <laughs> population-wise. Um, so we had half a million flyers. For every demonstration, we had 11 separate demonstrations. And every one of those flyers was distributed. And we never got left over with any flyers at the end because so many activists were out there on the day to day um, promoting these marches. And that's the result of the first march. So uh, that's O'Connell Street, which is the widest street in Europe, and we filled it from top to bottom. In fact, it went way beyond that. It was a 5.4 kilometer march that initially was supposed to be a short march, which was one kilometer, but the police force made us extend it for 5.4 kilometers. 
um, and there's a brilliant video I was just showing Stevie beforehand of um, outside Trinity College gates, uh, the front of the march meeting, the back of the march, which had a, a five kilometer around uh, 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 distance. So there was over 100,000 people there. RTE, our national broadcaster, said there was 30,000 people there, but um, it, was, it was just a phenomenal uh, event that we just, nobody, oh, the police couldn't predict it, nobody predicted the numbers that came out that day. It was just incredible. Um, it wasn't a flash in the pan. Well, actually, to give you an idea of how big that is, as, as I said, Man Ireland is the size of Manchester, Greater Manchester. It would be the equivalent of 1.8 million, 1.1 uh, million people marching in Madrid, 1.6 million people marching in London, 2 million people marching in Berlin, or 8 million people marching in Washington. That's the scale of that protest. So he, um, at that protest, to give this is the good, the bad, the ugly part of it. At that protest, there was huge disillusionment from community groups with trade unions. And there was punches thrown at the very front of the march against anyone that was wearing a trade union um, uh, Ida's vest, the security guards or the, the stewards that we had on the march. Uh, to the point that we were about to abandon the whole demonstration and just go home and leave it uh, because it was, it, was getting, it was too dangerous. And the guardian rang me and said to me, Dave, we see what's going on at the front. We're going to intervene. And I had to say, don't. We have this in hand. We didn't have it in hand. It was completely out, out, uh, out of hand. Um, so, what, 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 when the only trade union speaker who got up that day was Jimmy, a guy called Jimmy Kelly, who's the regional officer of Unite the Trinity Union who's the, in Ireland, and uh, he got booed off the stage. So it was getting very tense, and we didn't know what to expect. So myself and a, another founder of the campaign, Brendan Ogle, um, went out and met with these groups called Said No, or they were Said No to Posterity, and there's Dublin Said No to Posterity, Cork Said No to Posterity, all, all these groups that said No to Posterity. Um, there were 76 groups, and we met them in a pub in the Edenmore House, and we faced them down. And it got really heated, um, but they saw we were on their side, and eventually we won them over. And that was, in my opinion, the biggest turning point in the entire campaign. Mistrust in the unions for decades of uh, entering into what we call social partnership agreements, undermining terms and conditions of employment. Uh, doing pay increases that benefit people at the top, mm. not the people at the bottom. Um, but even during the five years of already austerity, there was no real, uh, the only actions taken to resist austerity were tokenistic. Um, so people were going through a really tough time, uh, trade union density levels were declining, and uh, working class communities all across Dublin in particular, but it, across the rest of the country, that to a lesser extent, but in Dublin in particular, felt abandoned by the trade union group and were really pissed off at us. Uh, and they were expressing that to these 76 groups that we met in uh, the Moore House. Uh, and it lasted about an hour. And we drove up to Glenavon and there was another public meeting up there. We did hundreds, and I mean hundreds of public meetings around the country to try and build trust with these communities again. Um, and it worked. It, it did work to a degree. So on the 1st of November, three weeks after the first demonstration, um, and this is the coalition building stuff again, we had a what were called local demonstrations. Um, now, to force the different political parties in particular, but the other groups as well, to work together, you could only advertise your event if you were coordinated with more than two of the groups attached. So, if people before profit were organizing an event, it wouldn't go on our website. It had to be people before profit and Sinn Féin, or it had to be Sinn Féin and Mandate Trade Union. So, we'd have to try and get them to cooperate a little bit more. Now, that worked. Everywhere except for in Blanchardstown, in, which is a working class community in Dublin, and in Limerick. Claire Daly laughing up here. Uh, <laughs> and the reason it, it, it did work there as well, we forced them to work together, but the compromise they had to come up with was that Sinn Fein were refusing to march with um, the Socialist Party, and the Socialist Party were refusing to march with Sinn Fein. So we said, all right, you still have to march together, is to march to a place in a different mode. So they they marched in different directions, but then they the building. And this was the result, and this is uh, organized, I just mentioned Claire Daly, um, my, I'm from Dublin, so Dublin MEP. She organized this event, Swords, North County, Dublin, small little town beside, um, there's about 40,000 people living in that town. I grew up in it. Uh, Claire organized that with a truck here, but 5,000 people turned up to that demo in a town that hadn't had a demonstration or a protest since since 1913. So, no, never a demo since 1913, since the lockout. That was the last demonstration that they had in that town. As far as I'm aware, demo, like, 
Alright, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so we had that, sorry, it was 1st of November, there was 106 of these demonstrations all across the country. Uh, there's great pictures if you look up just by tomorrow, 1st of November 2014. That's what frightened the shit out of every single TV in the country. Because <coughs> we have a, a very prominent uh, broadcaster lad called Vincent Brown, and he turned up to the protest in Donnybrook, which is one of the most affluent areas in Dublin. And on his show that night, he said, something is up when the richest community in Ireland match against water jerseys. We know something's happening here. So we had a few climb downs and a few attempts to please people by putting up and quitting work um, after that last demonstration. <coughs> so this is International Human Rights Day, the 10th of December 2014, where we brought up the, the Detroit Water Brigade. Um, at that time, 40,000 households in Detroit had already had their water shut off. It's now over 70,000 families who've had their water shut off in Detroit. And um, we flew over five people who experienced this firsthand, uh, people who, um, we're telling us the, the story of how if you your water shut off for 24 hours or for 48 hours in, um, in Detroit, you can have any dependents or children, your grandparents taken off you. And if your house is shut off for 72, or the water shut off in your house for 72 hours, they can confiscate your house and you don't live in it. And that was happening to clean a whole community in Detroit. And what had happened before that was the price of water in Detroit shot through the roof. People were paying bills of 3000 dollars a year in order to move people out of certain areas. So we brought those over, we brought people from Greece uh, over who were again in a, an IMF trying to bail out and were being forced to privatize their water. And we had a big celebration and a, a massive protest uh, on that day. That was a Wednesday in the middle of winter, last rain just after that. Um, and we had about 80 to 90,000 people on the street. It was 200,000 out on the, the local demonstrations. It continued, that, that wasn't the flash in the pan as I said, for two whole years, those numbers were coming out according to those demonstrations. So that's the 21st of March 2015, 29th of August 2015, and it was at this demonstration that we launched what was called Right to Change. So we wanted to see if this campaign was bigger than just war, and what could unite us all together. And, and what we did was we held a, a, a full on consultation process. When we talked about a coalition, we this probably the biggest thing that we did to try and build a coalition around this stuff. We had a conference um, where we brought in one third trade unions, one third community groups, and one third political party. And we sat people down and we asked them, is this bigger than war? Is this about housing? Is this about privatization? Is it about healthcare? Is it about education? And we went through a whole range of policies. And we came up with initially seven policies. And from that then, people went away. We handed them a booklet. And then it was a white booklet like this, um, and which had seven policies in it. We asked them to feedback, give, give us feedback. Um, send us emails in, observations, changes, amendments, whatever they wanted to it. After six weeks, we brought people back into another conference. Um, and again, one third community groups, one third political parties, one third trade unions. Um, and uh, we handed everybody that morning another document uh, with updates from the submission process that we had. And then each policy, that ended up being 10 policies, um, which I'll, I'll talk you through in a second. But out of those 10 policies, um, people at that conference got to make amendments to uh, all of the, the different groups that were involved. So that was that was our way of, of trying to make it a bit bigger than water uh, and have a political strategy around some of this. So we had right to water, but we had the right to healthcare, right to decent work, sustainable environment, housing, equality, national resources, education, and debt justice through the sort of manifesto of the Right to Change campaign. Um, and we called it policy principles. Of a progressive Irish government, but only one copy with me, but I'll leave it up here on the table if people want to flip through it. There's some really good policies in that. Um, and ahead, this is one week before the election. Um, so the government held firm on their water charges agenda right up until the election. And we had said in the trade union movement, we will pursue this right up until the general election and we will uh, annihilate you if you don't reverse your position on water charges. So that was the demonstration again on O'Connell Street the week before the election. Um, and this was the result. So the government was the strongest government Ireland has ever had in terms of the numbers they had. We have 160 TVs in all that we had at the time. Um, and out of the 160 TVs, 113 were in government. It was the Labour Party and Fine Gael, our most right-wing um, conservative government or, uh, party. That government lost 50% of its seats in, in that year. The Labour Party, where it was Alan Kelly uh, TV, who was the minister for for water charges, he was bringing in water charges for the Labour Party. 
And his party lost 18% of their seats. They went from 37 seats to seven. They were nearly wiped off the map and still haven't recovered. And I think there were six or seven seats still. They haven't, they haven't managed to, to regain the ground. The big beneficiaries were the left, really, but Sinn Féin in particular. Um, you can see the anti uh, border charges party's growth there to, to 49. Um, and we were talking about this beforehand as well. So Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are two right wing parties. Ireland has never had a left wing government, just to be clear. We've never even had social democratic government. Uh, we've had Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael dominating Irish politics for 100 years. And now those two parties who used to get 90% of the vote all the way through from, um, from partition, right the way through up until 2016, now can't even manage a majority on their own. Uh, a majority together combined. So it completely changed the political landscape of Ireland uh, permanently, I believe. And the outcomes from it is that we got water charges abolished. We made Fianna Fáil flip. They were the party that actually had agreed to bring in water charges in the first place. They flipped and changed positions. Um, so water charges are currently abolished, but as like everything else with privatization of profits, they're going to continue to, to pursue it and try and bring it back in. They're calling them for now what's called excess water usage charges, which 70% of the households should pay water charges, irrespective of how much you use. Like it, it's, it's about um, the 7% of people who use the most amount of water should pay for, for everybody's usage type of this nonsense stuff. And um, we haven't had a water referendum, and this is democracy for you. In 2016, in October, uh, uh, um, uh, a uh, motion was passed in the Dáil to have a water referendum to enshrine the public ownership of our water system in public hands permanently. Um, we're still waiting on that referendum. Um, they're talking about bringing it in next year, uh, but the wording that I've seen that they're proposing and the minister is proposing and where he's inserting in the constitution makes it as, as useful as a chocolate teapot. It's, it's, uh, it's completely irrelevant. It's, they're talking about saying uh, enshrining Irish water as an institution in the constitution. Um, which means Irish water can be there, but they're just outsourced everything. It's, it's nonsense. Um, but we still have zero water poverty. Um, and the communities who were so opposed to trade unions in 2013, 14, 15 are now completely behind us. When we went on strike in PESCO in um, 2017, the community groups got up and marched to Tesco's all over the country and uh, they held the picket lines because we weren't allowed to in certain parts. As Tesla on a lot of car parks and private property law means that the trade unions can't be in these areas. So the community groups, the water activists, blocked the the, the, the entrances to Tesco all across the country. And as a result of our activities on this campaign, just the last slide for me. Um, just the, the the learning, the lessons, and the dangers and the mistakes of the campaign, uh, which I think is really important uh, that people learn as that we all learn as we go along. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with Jane McAlevey's sort of breakdown of advocacy versus mobilizing versus organizing styles of, of, of campaigning. Uh, this was a mobilizing campaign. We never ever managed to get structures in place to organize people properly. Um, yeah, that was, it, like, whether it was possible or not, I don't know. Uh, in hindsight, looking back, you know, we were in a very difficult position where political parties didn't want, a lot of them didn't want to cooperate uh, throughout it. Trade unions um, wanted to just throw money at it, uh, have, you know, support the protest, pay for the demos, pay for the flyers, that sort of stuff, but never really um, engaged fully in it. There were two people who coordinated this campaign nationally. Two people. Uh, biggest mobilization we've talked about since, since partition, and there were only two people who had day jobs to do. I'm a communications officer for Monday Trade Union. I still had to write all of our articles, run our websites, run all our uh, newspapers, all that sort of stuff, as well as do this separately. So there's only two people part-time working on this. Uh, and then that's why we brought in Stevie and Trademark to do some of the political economy education sessions. But it really was 12 to 15 hour day, every day for about three years. Uh, and, and that's no exaggeration. When we were talking about this before driving back from Castle Bar one night, which is the west coast of Ireland, east coast of Belfast. Um, so it's about a five hour drive. And we were driving at two o'clock in the morning. And it was, do you remember the, the hailstones were hitting the car? And we, we just, it was just mad, a mad time. And the resources, as I say, two people, unsustainable to have a campaign like that. The democracy, we lost certain political parties who along the way who didn't want, um, they wanted to be the people driving this, they didn't want to be the people uh, who were a part of this. They wanted to be the people who were control of this. Um, and that, 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 that includes the trade unions, the trade unions want to be in control of this. Um, so we have to learn from that as well. 
Um, I would have personally liked to have brought in the neck when this campaign started. We didn't bring in enough, in enough trade unions. Now, there's, there's reasons for that. Uh, but we didn't actually reach out the hands to, to more unions to try and build. Um, but in terms of a success, uh, and this is the biggest success, and where we're seeing the danger right now, is the rise of the far right. I was at those, and Stevie was there as well, at all of those community meetings. I remember in Kilkenny, in, in a whole range, and where the right wing, the far right turned up to try and say, uh, this is the fault of migrants, this is the fault of refugees, this is the fault of asylum, it was all this nonsense. And we were at the top table and able to shut them down. Right now, with this cost of living coalition that's going on in Ireland and protest, there's still nobody shutting that stuff down. And the far right have, for the first time in Ireland, got a grip in certain communities across Ireland and Britain. I say far right, but there's more conspiracy theorists than far right, but it's 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 a dangerous trajectory, tra tra trajectory that are, are going on. Um, and I mentioned that there are structures, we never got in place structures to continue this campaign. So right now this campaign is dead, um, and I don't know how we can resurrect it yet. So I'm going to hand it over to Stevie then to, to, to wrap this up. Trademark, so that everyone knows, we're officially part of the Irish Conference of Trade Unions, the Irish equivalent of the TUC. And the ICT is about as useful as the TUC as well, by the way. And we're, a, we're a unit linked to the ICT, but the ICT is they could shut us down. But you managed to kind of hang on in there with good debt because you the members like us. And the members like us because the members want to be educated, they want to be educated around political economy and Marx and political economy. Two, way back in 2008, the global financial crash. We were approached by a couple of groups in Belfast who said, can you explain what happened? Um, will it happen again? And can you put on a course? And we said, no, go back to your union. You'll find all the answers there because you've got whole education departments in the union that do this stuff really good. But our job is anti-sectarianism. Our job is the peace process. We work next prison with paramilitaries. And anyway, those groups came back to us and said, no, the unions aren't doing this. There's no one in that union that can tell me how the world works. Which is a shock to me as a trade union, as a member of Unite. I assumed on day one when you joined the union, someone explained to you, the words capitalism and class, and the adopt your word used in this dialogue that explain how the world works. For the last 30 years of neoliberalism, institutions, even like trade unions, have been colonized by neoliberal thinking. So the spaces and the places where you enter, where you think you're going to get good political education, it's absent. And so from running a course in Belfast in the summer of 2009, it's now about 50 60 percent of all of our work, political education, teaching old, good old fashioned Marx in political economy telling members how the world works and their position within it. And that's how we were roped into this work. In about 2012-13, we were working with Dave Union in Dublin, we were doing trade union education. Not that we're really good at it, I mean that we're just a big fish in a tiny pond. We, we get loads of work over here, unbelievably, from British trade union groups, and you still don't do it. You still don't teach Marx and Blitz. I don't know what the fuck you are teaching, but it's not good whatever it is. And we get called all the time from over here to teach, and the, the lack of capacity in good old fashioned like trade and education is kind of shock. And so we've been trying to build that capacity in Ireland ever since. That's why we weren't involved in the right to walk campaign. One of the reasons was, as Dave said, there was a huge antipathy against the Irish Labour movement. And for good reason from communities. The Irish Labour movement has been stuck in social partnership for 27 years, <coughs> making top table deals with government that attacked the most vulnerable workers in Ireland that benefited a few of Dave's highly paid workers. Um, and when the social partnership collapsed because of the global financial crash, if Social partnership was put back on the table tomorrow. The Irish Labour movement would be straight back up that fucking brain pipe because it's easy work, an easy life for them. But when austerity hit, we had a Labour movement where shop students didn't know how to run a banner, they didn't know how to go on strike, they didn't know how to, there was no militancy. So our job was to try and instill some of that back into them. Um, and that's why we were invited them to work with the Right to Walk campaign, particularly because we knew that this was not a left wing campaign. There were people involved in the Right to War campaign that were populists, anti taxers, anti vaxxers, no <laughs> conspiracy theorists, the far right were there around the edges. And our job was kind of to police the edges of that movement, to identify those who were on the far right, identify those who were amenable to a left wing message, and, and pull them in, if you like, and try to stabilize the edges of that movement, but also give it a left wing steer. Most of the people involved in Right to War just didn't want to pay another bill. That, that, was, that was why they were standing outside their houses stopping meters going in. There's no left wing analysis behind it. It's that they didn't want to pay another bill. It was our job to take that feeling, to take that emotion, and put it into a political framework and give them a, a political rooting, if you like, for that anger. And of course, what did that mean? Well, it's very simple, and it's not rocket science. I'm going to put them all up there. We went, <coughs> we had, I don't know how many we had, we had hundreds of sessions all across Ireland from two hour 
political debates to two to three, in fact, up to four day intensive political schools. We ask all of those community groups to nominate their leaders, but well, it wasn't their party board, organic leaders who have election bangers, don't they? Yeah, just, you know, just, just, not, just not all punters from around the village or the town who were the leaders in that group. We asked them to send those leaders to Dublin, and they came to a three day political school with us, and all we did was teach them. That the privatization of water was part of a wider campaign. It's called neoliberalism. It's a thing called capitalism. It's a thing called class. This is the class you're in. This is the class they're in. This is the class that wants to own your water. This is the class that wants to make people pay. So not rocket science. It's very simple. And we did historical capitalism. We took them through the story of capitalism. If you want to explain what privatization is to someone, well, they have to understand that there's an ownership class, that there's a shareholder class, that there's a bourgeoisie, that there's a capitalist class. And once they understand that, they can identify it, and then they know what class they belong to. And through that kind of very simple education process, you create class consciousness. And that was really our job. Um, the difference in this program of political education is that we didn't stop. It was constant, it was continuous, we never let up. We were at it day in, day out for two to three years. The well, first thing that drops off every left wing agenda of any movement, of any trade union, is political education. We're too busy to do that. There's an election coming up, we've got a conference coming up. The most important thing for any fucking left wing institution is political education, the long, hard slog of teaching people how the world works. And none of us do it. We always let it slide off the edge of the agenda. Uh, and we didn't do that in Right to Water. And so one of the reasons why we were able to garner that community support in particular was it was fractured. And it was fractured. We pulled them on in. It was because of the commitment that we gave, like the trade union part of this campaign, gave to uh, political education. There was a report written about it, I think. As to buy TWT, was it being launched, I think, on Monday? But there is it. The report, Fiona, is there something being launched? Next on week, there'll be, yeah, next week. We got the mail on Monday. There's a report written about that where loads of people interviewed from the political education and why it was so important. Anyway, that was our role. Um, and since that work is finished, the campaign is finished, our work on political education hasn't. But I'd still argue that the left, broadly speaking, still doesn't do it. Was that, I was leave with this whole story. I was at a panel in London in April, and um, someone asked, what, and Baldwin was on the panel, someone asked, what's the importance of political education? And I looked at him and I said, well, if you'd have done any political education, you might have been in a position you're in now. Because your members and the people who join this party would have known the kind of party they're joining and would have been ready for the fight. Because what happened the last three years ago has happened before, and it will happen again. So political education at least teaches you who your enemies are and what you're up against. So that's what we did. And if you have any questions about it, we're willing to take them. Do you want to finish off there? Or are you happy enough? That's us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Selfies at the bus stop down the road earlier uh, last night, actually, when I, was, when I arrived and with the posters that were up. Um, coming from when we were talking about this last week as well, you know, the, the boycott movement itself was founded in Ireland, Captain Boycott in the, the 19th century. Um, so we have a great history of this. And I come from the Union, by the way, which, um, which for two years and nine months, our members went on strike 
uh, for the right to not handle South African goods. Um, and we're still heavily involved in the whole boycott, Israeli uh, uh, occupied territory goods as well, and Israeli goods. Um, so I'm fairly, fairly clear on these boycott campaigns and on understanding of them. And what, what I like about the Don't Pay campaign is um, that you're waiting until you get significant leverage before you do it. Because Claire might want to talk about this in a couple of minutes because the Levant Bill Tax campaign uh, as well in, in the early 2000s in Ireland, where there was a boycott attached to it, it, it was successful, but it was also unsuccessful in that there was a uh, it probably wasn't a, as well thought out as the water charges one, but um, and, and Claire actually spent a month in prison for, <laughs> for her participation in, in that campaign as well. Um, but the, the, the thing about the, the, the water boycott, um, the boycott the bill campaign that we had was these bills had never been in before. So we were starting from a base of 100% support for the boycott. And we, we were able to hold that position. We weren't looking for people to opt into this. We were asking people to not opt out of your position of not paying. You never paid the water bill before, don't pay it now. Um, which is a much stronger position to be in. So what I admire the don't pay campaign and what it's doing, um, with the right to water stuff, we were in a much, much easier position from a starting point. But the, the, if I was to tell you lessons of it, we use that as a framework to give people uh, the courage to continue as well. So whenever they announced the latest um, payment numbers, the government would announce the Irish water would announce them. And we were able to say, look, 70% of people haven't signed up, don't sign up. And if you have signed up, you register yourself from the process, right? So get those numbers all the way along. Every time, every two months or so, they want to release the figures. That was encouraging uh, for people. I mentioned earlier on, individuals within the campaign um, Call everyone involved in the campaign as an individual call for a, a, a boycott of the bills, not pay the bills. But um, the institutions like my own union didn't call for it because they had fears. People, certain people in the organisation had fears that this would backfire and people, the organisation would be fined. So if our members refused to pay, got, get an instruction from the union not to pay the bill, don't pay the bill, they go to prison or they get a big fine. Is the union going to pay that bill? So um, there was some institutions that were uh, didn't have the uh, courage or were too frightened in to take a particular stance. So that's why we made the call at the time as individuals that we're all making the call people shouldn't pay for our institutions not making that call. Um, but what I think needs to happen and I went to the website and had a look at the campaign and it's very clear, you know, you're giving good advice on it. And um, and what we always said all the way along through the war thing was people need to be fully cognizant of the ramifications if things go wrong on this. Um, that you can be fine, you can go to prison. And once people are aware of that and then they make the decision to avoid that the bills, then, then, then that's fair enough. The second point, and, and this is important as well, that's a tactic, and we talk about tactics and strategies. We have that as one tactic alongside a whole range of others, and that's important um, as well. We wanted to collapse Irish war. We wanted to make sure this institution died a death. We didn't want it around whatsoever. In the past, our water services were provided by local councils. We wanted it to go back into the local council so local council public service workers were working on this instead of people for the OLA. So that was our agenda. The Don't Pay campaign agenda, I don't know if it is to collapse the, the, the energy companies or it's to collapse whatever companies are going to point on, but it's something you have to consider and think about uh, for that institution itself. Where do you want it to go? Do you want it to collapse it? Or are you trying to get it to a situation where it has to be nationalized? And that could be a key issue for the I think everything should be nationalized, especially energy, water, and all the essential uh, uh, goods that we talk about. So um, I don't know, Steve, if you have any comments on it. Uh, but that, that's, that's what I think. Be honest with people, tell them what the ramifications are, build the campaign, use the statistics every time they come out. Or, you know, if, if, when you reach 200,000 to 200, I think it's 197,000 at the moment. When it reaches 200, Make a big fanfare out of it. Get every politician you can, get everyone else to say this is this is brilliant. Do do what you can to, to get it promoted. And I see that your website has huge resources behind. So if people are in the room and aren't aware of this stuff, get onto the website and have a look at the resources that are there because it is a really important and useful tactic and tool, but it needs to be backed by an overall strategy. And I think that's something that we can have a conversation about. Maybe I'll go back to my second, my second question to Steve. 
So you were talking about lots of different people being involved, the sometimes different political traditions and non um spurs theories, anti-vaxxers, etc. How did you build trust among all of these different people on the sort of community level within the community groups to actually work together, trust each other? Um and how did you do that on a on a national level as well? Um, the only and way what, to, and what can we learn from Yeah, that? the only way to build trust is to be in the room with people long enough and often enough and all the time and forever. You're not a flash in the pan, you don't just turn up on the result and you're flash and do your bit and fuck off. We were in those communities in 2000, well before 2014, and we're still in them, we still work with them, we still have all these networks that were established in 2014, and we're in contact with them all the time. We had a conference last week, you know, on this year, and from there we've had invitations to do more political schools, more political education, and working class areas throughout our life. Now, the issue is resources for how we do that, we'll find the money to do that. Um, it's about them, someone that was, it's actually, that link up, that link up thing two years ago, that someone said to me, how do you access these people? And I was like, fuck me, they're not animals in the zoo, they're, <laughs> you know, the idea that less from groups aren't living and based in working class areas is a real problem. I mean, there's almost like a geographical separation between the organised left and working class people. We don't have that separation. We, you know, Dave Hitler and I live in those communities, that's where we live and that's where we work. We have to be amongst people. You know, when I think of working class people, I think of my mum and my dad and my sister. I don't think of another group of people over there that I have to organise. It means we're in the pub and talk with all the local farmers who I live around. That's it's that commitment, it's that being in the place, being geographically rooted in those communities. And I argue that left isn't in those places, and that's a real fucking problem. Because you know who is in those spaces? The far right. Uh, and they're recruiting and they're organising in our communities because we are not so. Yeah, if you ask any of the people that we worked with, they know who we are. Uh, personally, they know we're always there, they know who we are, they know our name, they know about our family, that's trust. Trust isn't something created on a website or a Twitter feed, it's created in rooms with people that you meet regularly all of the time, that's what organising is. There really is no fucking magic bullets, it's simple. Thank you. Just, just to add to that, I mentioned the, the, the meeting we had in the Edenmore House where there were 76 uh, organisers of different groups from all over Ireland. Present and um, it, I think this answers your question as well <laughs> very strongly. When we went into that room, there was two of us and seventy six of them, and they were saying, "Where the fuck have you been?" And they were saying it that aggressively, saying, "Where the fuck have the trade union come from being? The fucking sellouts and all that sort of stuff." And in fairness to Brendan Ogle at the time, I remember him saying, "Don't ask me where the fuck I've been. Where the fuck have you been? I've been on the picket lines for the last twenty years. Where the fuck have you been?" He's turned up for one water loop and you think he's fucking all this now, but the user are superheroes and some sort of fucking savior of the working class. Where were we used for the train strike? And I I I I, I was at that the year before blocking Greyhound trucks and being arrested for blocking Greyhound trucks when they were on strike because SIP2 officials couldn't participate in that strike. You know, we're, we really progress and shitty with the trade union laws in terms of picking them, right? So we tend to get people outside of our own ways to do so. I was saying the same thing. I was saying I, I was on the picket lines there. I occupied the Paris Bay. I sat there for fourteen nights. I didn't see any news come in and fucking say that those workers who haven't been paid for three months are going to get more office. You know, so we were able to throw it back to them and say, no, our credentials match up with those. We're not saying we're better than these. We're saying that wouldn't it be great if we could work together on this? Because these are clearly radicals. These are clearly able to block it, the installation of a water meter. But we need to understand that there's more battles going on right now, and we need to unify as a country. So that, that to me is the most important thing is that we, we go out and we tell people um, you know, that we're on their side, we engage with them, and we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk, we, we stand with them when they're trying to block water in your installations. Um, one final question for me. Uh, something that's been talked about quite a lot here is the idea that um, pre-payment meters might be installed if people don't pay the energy bills, um, which are obviously much, much, much worse for people. And uh, there a lot, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, we need to resist that, we need to build community defence so that if they try and put on payment meters, we can resist that. And I was just wondering whether you could talk a bit more about that resistance that happened. And that is literally what we're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, there was no prepaid ones. Uh, again, we stepped from a really good position, um, and like the water campaign goes back to 
1970s, you know, because 1976 when we they tried to bring in water tariffs back then and it was blocked. Then in the mid 90s again we tried to bring in water tariffs. But this was the first time that really had a sustained campaign to put meters in the ground. It was a great moment actually, but I still remember where Mick Wallace is another MEP and um, myself and Claire were on a top day with 2014 um, speaking about it. And, and people were saying, look, this is this is a fucking disaster having a meter in the ground that's gonna uh, put a toll on my ability to use water. And people were genuinely fearful. I remember at one meeting uh, an older woman uh, said, I'm practicing for when water charges coming in. I'm only having like one bath a week. And I was just like, this is fucking this is surreal, like this is mental. Um, but Mick just got up on the wall and he, he went, so here's your pipe, here's your meter, here's the rest of your pipe. Go around it, jam it with a fucking uh, a screwdriver, damage it so badly that it doesn't work, or call us when we get into the rooms. And we actually had a brilliant moment as well, um, where, where there's a Facebook page set up, I don't know if people saw it, so you might know this, the water meter fairies. So you just post your address. We we were part of the delegation. Also, just, there, was also, there was also a really good tutorial video on the website on how to disable your own water. Nothing to do with us, obviously. <laughs> and to be fair, they linked up with the Super Mario Brothers in Rome. Uh, so there was a group called Super Mario Brothers in Rome who did the same thing, uh, Super Mario being a plumber. Uh, so we had water meter fairies in Ireland like the Super Mario Brothers, but we met the, the Italian actors, and I don't know if people are aware of this, but water shut offs have been happening in Italy as well, uh, in France, parts of Eastern Europe. Um, and so one of the tactics that all of the groups internationally seem to be using is attack your, your meter. Um, that might be slightly different with a prepaid meter. I don't know how you go about that. That's the thing. Yeah, now you've got to stick it in screwdriver. Or gas. It's going to be disastrous. Um, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have even considered it because I think we got rid of the prepaid meters of the Republic back in kind of like the 90s or so. Um, we don't have any, as far as I'm aware, we don't have any prepaid meters there. I know they have them up north. Uh, loads of them up north um, for prepaid meters, but I haven't even given them much consideration to be perfectly honest. But meter is a source of a weak point for me. Um, if you can figure out a way around it, we're a room full of people like this, I'm sure we'll come up with some ideas. <laughs> I heard of someone fixing uh, the energy meter so that they didn't pay anything for three years. <laughs> and then they just found, I don't know, they found a way. Hook up to a rich neighbor. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Right, does anyone have any questions? From the audience? Uh, great, so we'll do one, two, three, four, and then we'll do another round. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, just a comment, really. The prepayment payment is a big, most of the poor people in this country are on prepayment. Yeah. Thousands, if not millions of them. And they can't choose not to pay. And they're the ones that are really going to get it this winter. And I don't know how to fix that. Um, people are going to die. No message. And um, it's, it's incredibly serious, incredibly dangerous, and I don't know what to do. Um, but it's just something we need to remember. Lots of people have actually said they don't pay things. It's almost a middle class thing because it's slightly richer people that actually still pay. Um, through stirring debits. The poor people, they pay through the nose, way over the odds for their power, because this payment is really expensive, and they have no choice. And that is a real, real problem for us as a class, and I have no idea what to do about it. Um, the other thing as well is, I think the political education fund is incredibly important. Um, the late Mark Fisher talked about consciousness raising, how we need to go back to the modern feminist use way back in the day, of actually working with each other, reading books, understanding our position as a class, and remembering who we are, because we've been put to sleep um, by the neoliberals, and we need, to, we need to, not all of us, obviously, because there's people here, but most of us have been put to sleep by the neoliberals, we need to start thinking and waking up. And again, the only way to do that is by talking to people, there isn't any other way to do that. So. Anyway, that's fine, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
interested in him and how he set out deliberately to uh, uh, bring together different communities and groups in Ireland. Um, because I just came up from Luton, where on Thursday uh, we had a really successful rally um, of, uh, um, of Enough is Enough. And we said that Luton is the home of the English Adventure for the right wing. Actually, we want to strike the ball with the football support. So we brought together um, the Sikh community, the Muslim community, the Irish, the Irish community, older trade unionists, postal workers, um, railway workers, nurses, teachers, and so on. And they've all been, uh, everybody's been pushed into the same position as the government. It's a government more than religion. But the enough is enough campaign is, is, is a mass campaign. The one thing it does, um, connected with the right to change or the right to order in Ireland, is this role of the union. Sharon Brown refuses to support the enough is enough campaign. And I understand. She's trying to marginalize, trying to do totally nothing. My question is, what the hell is Sharon Graham doing? As the Unite member, I couldn't possibly comment, but I have no fucking clue what she's up to. So I'd love to know. Right, we're going to Come back to Mom when you said that there hasn't been a lot of referendum yet, but we don't have charges in Ireland. So it's been a few years. And my, I, I'm wondering from your perspective about um, whether you feel what would happen if that like, introduction of charges came back again? What would be your strategy or your ideas? Do you think the movement has dissipated and will be difficult to get the get it back? Is there a risk with this? And the, the main question is uh, the second one, kind of linking is that. Um, I have a question about the state repression for uh, using the police to you know, stop the mass demonstrations and arresting people for mixing with the leaders and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering if you would expect that to happen more now. Uh, so this in England, there's like these movements to have more state violence be available. Um, so that that's my question, what would you expect to happen? I think you did. Um, yeah, basically, I, I, personally, I'm kind of trying to get involved in more in political mainstream way and campaign, but I've been doing really pretty underground stuff in the past five or six years, squatting, um, all the conformity and environmental activism, and kind of radical groups, uh, grassroots groups, and don't really want to be in there, they can't remember anything, and stuff like that, and I'm just going to try and sabotage it. Uh, but I appreciate that that kind of thing always be the case. Yeah. But uh, then my question is uh, basically, um, we alluded to what you were saying about the conservation violence. Yeah. Yeah. And your campaign is really, an amazing campaign. Do you think the size of the local population is key? Because if you look at um, kind of like the, the, the scale of even the UK, with all, almost regionally, it's. Um, do you think we've got one of the big problems in organising this country is basically the fact that the left has been broken that many times by uh, how, how do we mend the left in, in uh, the UK basically to have this kind of effect in us? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, because ultimately, ultimately the, the population of the people in Ireland is a great asset to mobilising people and organising people, but when you've got the northwest, the northeast, the north south, sorry, the south, the southwest, the southeast, and you've all got different, say, for example, this particular example, like war countries. That's almost a million in each region. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, to even start bringing the increase in scale. So, how, yeah, how, what would your, what would your uh, advice be on kind of joining all these different parts of the, the regions of the UK? So just on the, the, the first question there about uh, would it be difficult to get back um, the, the, the right to order, yeah, 
<laughs> I think so. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of disagreements between different groups and different most of different individuals actually with uh, a lot of different um, different perspectives. Also, the leaderships of all of the trade unions that were involved has changed, and some of the leaders are not necessarily as sympathetic. So, will they throw money in behind the campaign if if water charges are brought brought back in? I don't know. Now, my own union was brought in since the beginning of the campaign. Every two years, we have a annual delegate conference where the members reaffirm their support for a campaign. So, in terms of the membership, there's there's, there's massive support, um, and I think it would be a more uh, organic. Is that the, the word you know? Um, it'd be more organic resistance the next time uh, there would be less coordination from trade unions. The political parties, I think, would would back it, but. Um, one of, one of the big things we had actually, you know, speaking of the Labour Party in Ireland, that um, there's been a massive housing crisis over the last six years. Over 10,000 people were homeless, uh, which, which is the highest we've ever had since, since again, since the foundation of the state in the 1920s. Um, and the reason we haven't been able to get huge resistance to this is, or a, a, a policy change on this, is because a lot of the communities that I spoke about refuse to march or associate themselves with any campaign that has the Labour Party in it as a result of the severe austerity that that party brought in during 2011 to 2016. <coughs> so it, it's fragmented the left, it was already fragmented even more. So even in this cost of living politicians, a major demonstration of today in Dublin, and there's a lot of those activists that are refusing to attend to the point of because of the fact that there's going to be people there for the Labour Party. So it's when water charges are brought back in the next time, um, it's going to be difficult to mobilise and coordinate and bring people together. But I still think there's something about water that, um, that, 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 that will get garner resistance. Um, they are quietly currently installing meters. All new house bills in Ireland have got water meters installed in them. So they're preparing for it. We're in no illusion that this is coming back. And the government have promised that uh, referendum this time next year, but next summer they're saying that they're going to have a referendum. As they say, there's two elements to it. One, um, they're going to insert Irish water as an institution in the constitution, which is unprecedented. It's, it's, it's just nonsense. And the second thing that they're going to do is they're going to insert it into a, the rights based section of the constitution. The Irish constitution, constitution is fairly solid, it's a quite decent document. Um, but there's different areas of it. So there's a government section, which is where I want the insertion to go to force the government to manage and maintain our water system. But the government are saying we want to put it in the rights based section, which then means it becomes an issue for a Supreme Court judge to decide on whether your right to private property, as in your right to own our water system, trumps my right to have a publicly run water system. So, in the history of Supreme Court judges not really backing workers you know, and working class people in Ireland, so we're, we're at that sort of juncture there. In terms of the resistance to state violence, just to give you an anecdote, like the first two demonstrations went down extremely peacefully in, in Ireland. We turned these into celebrations. And England was there. We had poets. We had Ben Hansler, Damien Dempsey, big singers come up on the stage. Uh, one of the demonstrations on December 10th lasted for uh, about eight, nine hours because we had so many poets. We had 36 acts because uh, I was coordinating the stage. And um, 36 acts, I found one third of which were, were musician bands, you know, with different groups, and, and poets, and all sorts of really entertaining events. And then then the state turned, which was really frightening actually. And I remember it very good because again, I was a coordinator with the Guardian the Police Force in the area. And they tried to make it look like it was the water protesters that were turning. We did, we did an escape valve on the December 10th protest. Um, see if I can get you a picture of it. But an escape valve for, for, for any crushes or anything that would happen and, and people could, uh, if they were overwhelmed, could, could get out the back of the demonstration. Once the demonstration filled with 80,000 people, they collapsed that. So there was no way of. There was a bunch of disabled children. There was a photograph of this, and I, it broke my heart at the time because I was right in front. And all these kids in wheelchairs were trapped and couldn't get out and they started crying. And the guard, I, I lifted some of We were lifting them over, trying to lift them over the back of the stage to help them out. And the guard blocked us and said, You can't get those children out. So then the crowd saw all that happen, and the crowd erupted and started throwing things at the guard. They were trying to provoke violence. They were trying to get a reaction from us to turn this sour so that people would turn away from the demonstrations. And we saw that then as well in the newspaper articles about the subsequent. So we're talking about a demonstration and a movement that had 500 people on it. And one of the articles in the newspaper said, like, 
took a photograph of somebody marching and said, This former IRA member was marching on the demonstration. If you have quite one of those people marching, <laughs> 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 so it became this dissidence of supporting the water charges movement. So the media were trying to turn the, the, the agenda of what was the most peaceful and um, celebratory protest movement we've ever had into this whole sinister fringe was the term that the minister used in the doll on that day to say there's a sinister fringe in here which was nonsense nobody's looking for rallies to close the day. oh yeah one one tv compared us to isis <laughs> on the doll record it said they are the equivalent of isis <laughs> as if we were beheading people <laughs> It was, it was nuts. Yes. So some of the papers are not by Dennis O'Brien, who was just installing the water meters. Um, as, but uh, and even the national broadcaster, I, 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 as I said, I work for the Connections Officer, so I speak to a lot of journalists, and they were telling me some of the journalists who were in support of our campaign were telling us that, that they were being completely isolated in their own workplaces for writing pro water charges articles. The media in Ireland? No, not really. It's, no, it's, we have our own indigenous language. <laughs> 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 it's we, we were fairly, we, we kept it fairly simple. Uh, we kept having fans playing. We, we, we played a great bit with uh, UK, um, or people familiar with UK, but Dubliners and music playing through these demos. We we just kept it really friendly and turned it into an absurdity that they were saying there's a sinister thing here. We made it seem like these are being lunatics here, lads. Come, and, and they call them about one this. People, people celebrate the whole big lynch thing by just being straight about it. Turned it into a laugh. You said, well, fucking ISIS. Did you see the. I, I remember the, the side of the 29th of August uh, demonstration. Um, there was this old couple dancing at the side of the stage, and they were probably in their 80s. Like, they got up out of their wheelchairs and said, that's my live stream video of these people saying, look at these ISIS drag heads dancing at the side of the stage. And it, it works, then the media feel like, oh, shit, I can't use that anymore. So, um, but the provocation from the Caribbean was interesting because the drug letters complained to. Um, the, the uh, GSOC, which is the investigation module, well, that was an article. Well, my tactic had been to the whole thing was publish every letter of complaint so that the supporters could see what we're doing. So I, I, I got letters of complaint to RTE, which yesterday was the anniversary one, the French Book of Memory top up. Um, and, and it was a big long one that got shared thousands of times because it reflected what people were thinking. And you're making a mockery of both the Gardaí who are making allegations or being provocative. And a mockery of the media will report on that stuff. And when people see that method, it pops up from time to time. If you look at my Twitter page from yesterday, they don't have to row with people again around water charges. Um, um, and constantly using examples and real figures and facts to, to back it up. So, yeah, that, that's probably the best strategy to keep it simple and just call them out on the whole issue. I just wanted to briefly come back to what you were saying. Um, yeah, some of the pictures of that rally and it looked amazing. And personal, my personal opinion, those campaigns are not opposed to each other at all. In fact, we need them both. And we need, you know, over the next few months, like we need all the different trade unions to strike. We need the tennis unions to resist the evictions. We need, you know, those those people who can uh, to not pay their bills in in sort of a mass uh, movement. We need the national <coughs> to be organising mass rallies, and we need all of those things. And they're not in opposition, and I think it's events like this one where all of those campaigns can come together. This evening at 7 p.m., I'd really recommend there's a really big rally in the main hall called the Working Class Strikes Back, and that has got Unite, Enough is Enough, Don't Pay, the left of the Labour Party, and others at it. Um, and I think it will be a really, really powerful moment to come together. And I really hope that these four days will allow us to strategize. Um, and basically discuss how we can take those campaigns forward over the next few months. Um, I'm going to take one more round of comments and questions. We've got here. Uh, I was just going to say the same thing, really, but to thank you for such great uh, talk. It's really interesting. 
club and uh, obviously the importance of the coalition. And I was going to ask the same, you know, it seems like we've got kind of similar pillars going on the Anarchist Club and have been much more institutionally backed by the unions and then the support that Joan Payne has made. There did seem to be some tensions between those and the oil because this thing is dead in the water because they can't be back on the control and they can't um, work together. But it, you've answered it really it's really great to know that there's those conversations we can be happy to with you I guess. Um, I was just going to ask, I guess, uh, about trademark Belfast. So, you guys are filling in a, a space which is you're providing physical education, marketing and physical education. You said that the trade unions, you expected the trade unions to do it and not doing it. So, how do we do this? How do we? I mean, I'm one of the founders of Bristol Transform, which is a bit like the World Transform. These transform festivals are happening probably over the century. The one thing that I think some people will see as a critique is that it mostly draws in the already engaged or the activist there. And you're talking about how the trademark Belfast manages to be embedded within the working class community. How do we get to that? Do you see any sign of that happening in the UK? And where, for example, the Elevate the School of Organising which sounds a bit but similar to what Trademark Belfast are doing, but I'm not really sure if they've achieved scale or, or some results. So that's the question. How do we do that? Do you see signs of it happening in the UK? Yeah. Yeah, my question is kind of about um, countering the bus race. So I guess Jane will be for the articulation. In England, you don't pay. There's a lot of like, fear mongering in the media that if you don't pay, you're going to get collected and play into run. And even on the left, there's people saying that we should have an organised response to if anyone comes out of this. And the don't pay kind of consistently respond like, well, there will be people who cannot pay. So this is probably quite a good chance for those you know middle class who can afford to pay the races to kind of stand in solidarity and um, not pay. So I was just wondering with white supporter, like what kind of rhetoric did you um, encounter from the other side? And um, how did you respond to it? <coughs> Um, it being a mobilisation campaign, and then the kind of the the inability then to make that into a formalised sort of structured movement. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more about why that was the case, and if you could go back in time and do things differently, so we have different outcomes there, and what would you do with that? I'll answer the first one from the comment here. Very much in a very lucky position in the sense that because we've we, we been working with these projects for 25 years, all of our working unions, that's our kind of happy place. We tend to avoid the left wing spaces because they're full of the controversy, if you like. And so um, when we got involved in the right towards the campaign, our work is in the community, and that's our kind of that's our happy place, that's our comfortable place being with the ones that I sort of get up being with my family, there's no difference. Um, the other thing I would say though about the left wing spaces, and particularly for some reason recently, is that um, the left wing makes it really hard to feel like coming into those spaces. They're all these fucking rules and regulations and things within their own box, doing exercise. You can't say this, you can't say that, you can't do this. The right have none of those, by the way. If you want to join the right, you've just got to fucking hang someone. And you're in. <laughs> and you're in. You've got all of these urgent people all the time. Um, and in our spaces that we create, we don't make them more comfortable. Some of you might be affected by the language in them. I am regularly in our challenge, but I need to. But the most important thing is that we're working class people in the room to be talking about. Marx and political economy talking about the history of capitalism. In order to, for that to happen, you have to leave the door wide open and you have to let anyone else to walk in and walk into that space. And I kind of find that I really find that we don't do that. We just close the door on people all the time. There was a meeting recently, one example, a young lad, 18 years old in West Belfast, it was a Katu meeting, you know, in the tennis shoes in Ireland, the acorn equivalent in Ireland. And he was organizing locally in West Belfast on a, it was on a Zoom call with all these other people in Dublin. And he said, oh, there's a new foreign family who lives in my street. And he got fucking hammered for using the term foreign family. We love just using the language that he had to describe. And he was out there helping that family, knocking on their door, saying, do you want to get involved? 
but we lost him because some fucking asshole in Dublin corrected his language in class A in this place. And that really young world from Bart Ankovic, who knows what he might have become, had just gone there, God knows where it's gone to. So I think we have to seriously think about how welcome the spaces we create are, but also getting out into the community. And there's no shortcut there, you just go and do it. Go and set up a meeting in the community hall, see who turns up and take it from there. Just one thing, like the elevator school, for example, would sound like you're doing a very similar thing, recognizing the gap where political education should exist, and trying to fill that gap. But I'm aware of the fact that they have difficult resources, not a lot of money, not a lot of manpower, not a lot of boots on the ground. So, do you, are you guys a better resource because of the amount of the police campaign and most people have to have the same thing? Um, we have a kind of political education, an all island political education project called Left Block, which is a kind of podcast platform on the website. But the other thing I want to mention, I know Dave's going to answer the other two questions, is that the trade union movement is the place for political education. If you're in your union movement, demand better, demand more for education officers, demand more of curriculum. The amount of time wasted in fucking trade union education on health and safety equality, there's nothing in it about capitalism and class. So if you're in a union, if you're in a branch, demand better education. Unions are well resourced, they have all of the capacity, and everyone in the work trade unions is part of the working class. We talk about how do you access these communities? Well, they're in the union. Those people are in our union. So we need to recolonize our education, our union movement as well. So if you're in the union, that's one quick way as an activist to ensure good political education starts happening. Um, and the one thing that hierarchical unions are afraid of are their members. And they're afraid of their members being angry and they're afraid of their members challenging them. So if you're in the union, do that and do it well. <laughs> um, just to answer the, the inoculation question there um, and the rhetoric that was spoken by the side, which is a very significant, powerful um, argument that they were making. And it was all about conservation. And we have so many uh, wasters of water, is, is the argument they were making all the time. And the way we countered it was research. It's a bit like the local education stuff that we have together. Um, when we did those roadshow tours, I gave a presentation specifically about water. And I got like a, a one hour presentation that I give on, on the profits that are being made globally on water um, and how uh, meter domestic water charges would not reduce consumption, it actually tends to increase it in certain countries like Australia. So we had all that stuff to put on the, the uh, directory uh, that they had, and it worked quite well for those that were there. And then it was actually on the rightwater.ie website. There's a, a couple of blogs that I've written in the past that and they're all looking at the statistics. 80% of the water that's used in Ireland is used by businesses, not by households. Um, but yeah, there's no abstraction charges in, in, in Ireland. So when we drink a bottle of Ballyhill Irish water, they don't pay for that water. The company doesn't pay for that water. It's owned by Britvic, but Britvic is a, 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 a multinational that's got on the London Stock Exchange. So they're abstracting water from Ireland. Put it in a bottle and sell in the back to it. Hence, when I was in Dublin Airport yesterday, there's one of those honest bottle bins where you can take a bottle and leave for one euro. I took it and paid for it as much as they paid to put the water in the first <laughs> Which is what happened to me every time I was in I'm not paying for it. Water. Again, like. So, um, and then we have data centers opening up all across Ireland. Ireland has become the data center um, headquarters of, of the world. Um, data centers, again, do not pay a penny for the water they extract from our ground. Not a penny in Ireland. This minute of time, and one data center right now, the Amazon one is using more water than 40,000 households a year. One data center is using 76 of them at the moment. So, um, so, so, yeah, facts, figures, present that and put them up on blogs and let people have the information uh, to share themselves. It, it, it's the most important in terms of doing what would we do differently in terms of the structures throughout the process between 2016 and 2019 or so. I was pushing for a formalized structure between the three community pillars. Or to three pillars the community pillar, the trade union pillar, and the political pillar. And I wanted to, to keep it tight and focus on, on, on five things specifically. Set up our own media. There's clearly a deficit in terms of the media there. So we needed a left wing media in Ireland, um, which is why we, we've engaged in left, left block. We've got a, a podcast in the CD set up. And we were on Kinnish here in Ireland last week where we did the political economy education. Um, but I, I just put up an article this morning about which you guys would be interested in based on Stuart McGill, um, the, the energy policy in the EU. So we need an alternative media project. It would organize national demonstrations, local demonstrations, and then the political wing would provide a legislative framework to enable us to go out and organize people and make it a little bit easier in trade unions and 
something else to implement some of the stuff. But in that structure that I've drafted, and I, I, I have it on the PowerPoint somewhere, um, in the center of it all is education. So the media is about education, the national demonstrations, the local demonstrations, and the legislative frame is all about education, the whole thing is framed on that. So um, that's what I would do differently on, on that front. No, I'm just got an announcement again. Okay. Just before we go, first of all, just give you a round, give a big round of applause. For you. I just want to say this is a session about coalition building. And I think it's really, really, really important to remember coalitions aren't just built from the top, but also from the bottom. I think for too many years, I'll get called on this leader, everyone sort of had this attitude on they're gonna they're gonna do it at the top. Well, that's gone now, because the group is never there. And please, please use these next four days to debate with as many comrades as possible. If you have disagreements, have them out, we're here in person to do that. Um, and let's come out of these four days with a better vision, better idea of tactics and strategy. And it would have been a really, really worthwhile four days. Thank you. Thank you very much. It doesn't clash with the rally. It's a kind of a DWD fringe event. I don't mind me calling that. There's, a, there's a, um, an event in the Adelphi Hotel at six o'clock in the Pierce Room called Jockey RLR. As Irish Unification come. Uh, it's Claire Daly, MEP speaking, Chris Hazard, MP for Sinn Fein, Maeve McDay, researcher, and myself talking about the potential for border polls and Irish reunification, particularly in light of the census figures that come out on Thursday that shows that the historic Protestant inbuilt majority in the north of Ireland is gone. So times are changing. So six o'clock in Delphi, you better all be there or I'll be there and do it. <laughs>